This is the lecture about placenta previa. You might benefit from first viewing the videos about placenta part one, where we discussed anatomy, the circulation and the physiology of the placenta, and part two, where variations in the placenta, membranes and umbilical cord are presented, and pathology. Um, placenta previa definition, what are risks, what are the consequences of a placenta previa, what are typical symptoms, what is required for a reliable diagnosis, and what is the management of a placenta previa. And we finish as always with a summary. Let's refresh your memory a little bit. This is the how the maternal surface of the term placenta looks like. In the periphery here we see the membranes. This is the area which has been attached to the uterus, to the so-called decidua, and the metrium changed by pregnancy hormones. When we turn the placenta around, this is the fetal surface. You can see the umbilical cord and the blood vessels spreading over the surface of the placenta. A cross section of the placenta shows as follows. On top here, the myometrium. Below that, see the decidua basalis, the endometrium, which was, has been changed and now is called decidua rather than endometrium. And here, the very important spiral arteries. They deliver oxygenated blood into the intervillous space. This is the intervillous space. And what you can see in the intervillous space is the tree of the fetal circulation branching out into small villi. This is the fetal part of the placenta. And this is the area where the maternal fetal, fetal interface is located and where the exchange takes place, for instance, O2, CO2, and glucose. And below we have the umbilical cord. Two um, arteries and one vein. Lovely. What is the definition? The placenta previa means in the third trimester, the placenta covers the cervix. Or, in other words, the placenta is inserted in the lower uterine segment and covers the internal cervical, cervical os, partly or completely. The internal cervical os, here a cross-section through a non-pregnant vaginal cervix and lower uterine segment. Here this is the area which we refer to as the internal os. Um, just a little bit higher, is this is called the isthmus. This is the lowest part of the uterus, important uh, as we will find out a little bit later. Here higher up we have the corpus with the myometrium and this represents the cervix. This is the external os, which is visible when we do a speculum examination. Good. The classification of placenta previa. It depends on how much of the placenta covers the internal os. The top picture shows that the placenta is close to the internal os but does not cover the os. That's the so-called marginal placenta previa. The picture here, the placenta is partly covering the os, partial placenta previa, and the picture below is the placenta is completely covering the os, also called in another definition system, grade four. Here it's depicted antepartum hemorrhage. We will find out that that is not a necessary um, symptom of a placenta previa. What are the risks of a placenta previa? The placenta might separate from the uterine wall as the cervix begins to dilate during labor. Hence, that is a partial abruption or a complete abruption. The result could be massive PPH, which has consequences, hypovolemia, hypovolemic shock, and even um, life-threatening uh, hemorrhage for the mother. And, of course, there is restricted perfusion to the 
through the placenta, which will jeopardize the fetal circulation and well-being. So this condition can be completely asymptomatic, but all of a sudden change into a potentially life-threatening situation for both the mother and her child. What are typical symptoms of a placenta previa? Most often it's asymptomatic. It's an incidental finding of a so-called low-lying placenta when we perform a routine ultrasound screening scan for the, what we call the morphology or anatomy at 90 to 20 weeks of gestation. Typical is painless antepartum hemorrhage initially. And that's different from an abruption where there is quite often continuous pain or preterm labor where there's intermittent uterine contractility related pain. Three, sometimes stance fares or an oblique fetal lie can point indirectly at a placenta previa in the rare circumstances where a lady has not yet had an ultrasound scan. Transverse lie should start a differential diagnosis. What is the cause of the transverse lie? And one of the causes in the differential is the placenta previa. Diagnosis, ultrasound scan. Ultrasound scan is when applied carefully, very sensitive. It's very good at detecting a low-lying placenta or a placenta previa. Transvaginal scan or a transabdominal scan if the bladder is full. If the bladder is not full, that could result in false uh, diagnoses. An example of a transabdominal ultrasound scan at 19 weeks. This picture shows the sagittal plane. We can see here the cervix. On the right hand side, black is a filled nicely filled bladder. The arrow points at the internal os of the cervix. On the left hand side the fluid there is the amniotic fluid and here the gray area is the placenta. It's clear that this is the placenta and it covers the os. The placenta is located on the anterior uterine wall. Please note this is a second trimester, per definition, low-lying placenta and not yet a third trimester placenta previa. What is the management of this incidental finding of a low-lying placenta? First, explain and reassure the woman and her partner if the placenta at least is not completely covering the os. Be aware that you're competing with Dr. Google and that the pregnant lady might already have read some scary stories about placenta previa and the possible complications. A practical advice is uh, to avoid what we would call undue pressure on the cervix. For instance, avoid sexual intercourse. This is common sense and there has no, not been a randomized clinical trial as yet. It will never be done, of course. We could call bleeding after sexual intercourse or straining a provoked bleeding. We would tell the lady to present in case of antepartum hemorrhage, always to present, and we would repeat the ultrasound scan in the third trimester, so around 32 to 34 weeks, because then the placenta will have taken up its definitive position. Then we can answer the question whether we are dealing with a placenta previa, yes or no. The formation of the lower uterine segment. We see here a couple of diagrams from 6 weeks, 10 weeks, 16 weeks to term. The checkered area represents the myometrium. Here you can see the cervix and the vagina. And here is the embryo. And on the right hand side we see the fetal head. What happens over time? Look at this green arrow here, which we point at the internal os. This is the second arrow, represents the lowest part of the 
uterine segment. And in between those errors, that's by definition the isthmus, which we discussed before. In term situation, the two errors are further apart. And this makes clear that now, and the yellow arrows point at the lower uterine segment. Whilst the myometrium here is very close to the internal os, at term, the myometrium is much higher up. And this area is the lower uterine segment. This explains why a placenta, a low-lying placenta at 19 weeks, um, will be different possibly in the third trimester. It appears that the placenta has moved away from the internal os. It appears that the placenta has walked away from the internal os. But let me reassure you, thorough research under the microscope has shown that the placenta has no little legs or feet at all. So whilst we use the expression that the placenta moves away, it's a simple way to express the formation of the lower uterine segment. Let's now repeat the ultrasound scan at 33 weeks. The same sagittal plane section in the midline. On the right hand side, you can see the full bladder. Here, the next is the label on the surface, on the cervix. This is the gray area, is the placenta, and this is the internal os. So it's clear that the placenta is completely covering the internal os, hence now, per definition, we are dealing with the placenta previa. A transvaginal scan. A represents the anterior lip of the cervix, P the posterior, and the arrow points at the internal os. And on the left hand side, PP, is the placenta previa. So the placenta is also covering the os completely. Important to realize that a transvaginal ultrasound scan should be performed always gently and with respect and maintaining dignity, but in particular, in case of an antepartum hemorrhage, we have to be mindful that the probe should be inserted extremely carefully in order to prevent a, to prevent a provoked bleeding. On the right hand side we see the diagram which shows uh, the placenta previa here, the internal os, and this, is the trans, this represents the transvaginal probe, which we can see here in the semicircle on the left panel. What is the management of placenta previa? I think there is no obstetrician or midwife who would not agree that a placenta previa completely covering the os should, that the baby should be delivered via a lower segment cesarean section. That's obvious. Now, what about the timing? When should we perform the cesarean section? Ideally for the baby after 38 weeks and 5 days. But the timing depends mainly on the fact whether the pregnant woman has symptoms and signs of antepartum hemorrhage or not. If there's no APH, we would usually advise her to be electively admitted, admitted to the hospital after, for instance, 34 weeks. Because if she would ha have an antepartum hemorrhage, she's close, she's in the hospital, and we can manage her as safely as possible. If, however, she lives close to the hospital and then has an adult company and transportation to the hospital, she could stay at home with clear instructions to represent as soon as she might notice some bleeding from her vagina. We would, in case of absence of antepartum hemorrhage, book the cesarean section, plan the cesarean section around 36 to 37 weeks. However, important that we would give the mother a 48 hours course of beta metazone intermuscularly to promote the fetal lung maturation. So we steroid the mother, as we call it. If there is significant or recurrent antepartum hemorrhage, the recommendation would be to bring the cesarean section forward, and we would do an emergency cesarean section. Important to note as well that placenta previa is associated with an increased risk of postpartum hemorrhage because the lower uterine segment is, as we saw 
does, does contain less myometrium and the myometrium, the myometrial contractility, is the primary hemostatic mechanism, as we have discussed in the video about postpartum hemorrhage. What is the management in all cases of antepartum hemorrhage? Check the maternal hemoglobin, also the ferritin, that's something you can do in the antenatal clinic, make sure that her iron stores are solid. In case of bleeding, ask, check also for cross-match some bloods and you might want to uh, have some packet cells readily available. In case of research negative blood group, we would administer the full dose, that's 625 international units in Australia of NTD intermuscularly. We would also take some bloods from the mother and we would perform a so-called Kleihauer test to verify and quantify if fetal maternal transfusion has taken place. I'll explain that a little bit later. In case of massive bleeding, of course, we would start with Dr. ABC. Danger, resuscitation, airway, breathing and circulation. Maternal well-being here is paramount. If the mother is stable, we can deal with the fetus. Check for maternal coagulopathy. If there is disseminated intervascular coagulation, DIC, it's important that we should not embark on a crash cesarean section before having given the mother um, clotting factors, um, platelets, etc. The fetal red cell detection test, or the so-called Kleihauer test, Here's a picture under the microscope. Maternal red blood cells here, and here we see a few dark uh, purple fetal red blood cells. They still contain the nucleus. That's why they are easy discernible by the naked eye. So under the microscope here, we have found that fetal red blood cells have entered the maternal circulation, but more importantly, we can count the number of fetal red blood cells and the laboratory can quantify for us how many milliliters of fetal red blood cells have entered the maternal circulation. And that makes it possible to, con to check whether the standard dose of 625 uh, units of rhesus D or NTD um, was sufficient. This is the strategy to prevent synthesization of the maternal immune system, which could cause um, uh, resistive antibodies in the next pre pregnancy crossing the placenta. This is what we prevent. In summary, placenta previa, the typical history, usually no symptoms whatsoever. Most often is an incidental finding of a low-line placenta at a morphology scan. If symptoms, painless antepartum hemorrhage is the most typical one. Or transverse or oblique fetal lie could point indirectly at a low-lying placenta or placenta previa. The ultrasound scan, the grayscale ultrasound scan, is the diagnostic tool we use, and it's very reliable, it's very sensitive. Management, caesarean section, timing depends on the presence or absence and the amount of antepartum hemorrhage, and of course, in case of antepartum hemorrhage, whether there are CTG changes or not. Always prepare for massive antepartum and postpartum hemorrhage and ensure antenatally that her iron stores are replenished. For the placenta accreta, I would like to refer you to uh, another uh, dedicated Daroga video. The same applies for the placental abruption. So, the placenta is truly a fascinating organ, vital for fetal well being. Moreover, the placenta should not cover the internal os in the third trimester and not partly or completely detached before the fetus is born. Wow, if you would realize that as placenta, you would be slightly nervous. Like in this little cartoon, no need to be nervous. It's my first execution as well. Do I look nervous? Thank you for your attention and I hope you will look at a few more videos about this fascinating placenta.